Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, welcome to this session of the Ethics and Culture Conference on Friendship. Today we have a wonderful panel on civic life and personal friendship. So a, a wonderful topic to explore. And we have three speakers who have instructed me to be ex exceedingly brief in my introductions so that we may have more time for their presentation and for uh, question and answer and discussion. So I will oblige uh, because they've asked me to. So uh, the very minimalist introductions are, we have Professor Ricardo Calleja from the University of Navarra in Spain. Uh, and he there teaches in the uh, teaches in the business ethics department at ESA Business School. Uh, I could say more, but I won't. I'm following instruction. <laughs> uh, so then our second, so that he will be our first speaker speaking on political friendship in the conflicts of modernity. Our second speaker will be uh, Richard Dorflinger of the Ethics and Culture Center, the De Nicola Ethics and Culture Center. Uh, and he's also known for his wonderful work uh, in the pro-life office at the U.S. Bishops Conference for many, many years. His talk will be, No Greater Love is Giving One's Life for One's Friends a Secular or Religious Value. Uh, and then last but not least, we'll just follow the order of the program here. Uh, we're very happy to have Professor Danielle Mark from Villanova. Uh, he is... Uh, a political theorist, a political scientist. He did his PhD at Princeton and has served as the chairman of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, for which we're all grateful as well. And Professor Mark's paper will be Family and Civic, civic Friendship. Um, so again, we'll go in the order that the, the speakers appear on the program. They will each speak for 18 to 20 minutes and uh, I have cards here given by the Ethics and Culture Center to remind them. Of, so, and then that will allow at least 15 minutes for a question at the end. So uh, without further ado, our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to share the panel with Richard and, 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 and Daniel. I'm very thankful for the presence of so many friends today. Um, my intention is to ask just a couple of questions, try to ask a couple of questions. This is not a full paper <coughs> in any sense. So I look forward for your feedback and comments. The first one is if it is necessary for a good life to engage in political friendship. The second is if that is possible in the context of what echoing McIntyre would call the conflicts of modernity and to what extent uh, that affects the, the practice in, of, of political friendship. Um, and I will, do, I will try to answer those two questions by answering some more questions. The first one is, what, what do we mean by these uh, conflicts of modernity? Then w what is friendship? Something that we can take for granted in this conference, but still it's good to, to, to review. What is problematic about political friendship? In, in particular, uh, and then also following, uh, not, not very closely, but following uh, discussions by Professor McIntyre and Professor Finnis on, on the common good, I will ask myself, what is, what is the nature of the political common good that, that uh, political friendship consists in? Um, and then, yeah, the, 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 final, the, the final question of how, how that is affected by, by, by the conflicts of, of modernity, and then some conclusions. So just to get started, and, and I'm not trying to be, as I say, uh, uh, exhaustive in, in, in my answers, but by the conflicts of modernity, some, some, some key words come to mind when reading the work of Alasdair McIntyre. You know this, this phrase comes from his last big book, Ethics in the Conflicts of Modernity. And the first conflict of modernity or source of conflict uh, typical of modernity, according to McIntyre, is, is fragmentation. This is the beginning of his After Virtue, first chapter, uh, very famous. <coughs> what we possess, if this view is true, are the fragments of a conceptual scheme, pants, 
parts which now lack those contexts from which their significance derived. We possess indeed simulacra of morality. We continue to use many of the key expressions, but we have very largely, if not entirely, lost our comprehension, both theoretical and practical, of morality. And this obviously affects political morality and, and, and political practice, fragmentation. A second aspect is uh, compartmentalization. So the fact that we live our lives, uh, and I also quote this time the, uh, the last book, Ethics in the Complex of Modernity, it is a characteristic of the social order that we now inhabit that many of us most of the time lead highly compartmentalized lives, moving during the normal day, the normal week, the normal year, between one social role and another, from conformity to the set of norms governing one area of our lives to the often very different set of norms governing another area. Um, a third element of these conflicts of, of modernity, I would say, is not explicitly described in McIntyre's work, I think because he takes it for granted as a consequence of the previous two ones, which is uh, political polarization something that we discuss very much these days. And as I say, something that is, I, I would assume, for, for McIntyre, the necessary consequence or implication of, uh, of emotivism. So uh, if, we, if we define the emot emotivism as the doctrine that all evaluative judgments are more specifically, and more specifically, all moral judgments are nothing but expressions of preference, expressions of attitude or feeling, insofar as they are more moral or evaluative in character. Well, if that is the case, then it is obvious that, that <coughs> politics is not going to, 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 to lead to a, to, to a real dialogue, and therefore it's going to end up in polarization uh, among different competing parties that use discourse as a tool, as a strategic tool for, for power strategies and not, and not for dialogue open to, to truth, theoretical or practical. Uh, and a fourth element is, is the, the, what he describes in, when, when he describes the, the conditions of, of late modernity, the bureaucratic modern state and modern politics and, and the market, and uh, what he describes as the pervasive rule of privileged elites that control the system and the institutions of the market and, and the state in, in, in very relevant ways, uh, making it the idea that there is a common good between those elites and normal people, regular people, difficult to, to accept. Okay, in, in this, let's, we will get back to these uh, uh, circumstances, but then let, let's get back to the, the main question, which is what is friendship? And, and as I say, I think we can assume that we are, that we, uh, that we are, we have in mind that friendship, uh, and here I quote John Finney, but he's expressing things that are clearly from Aristotle and, and the whole tradition. I'm not quoting literally, because I'm trying to make things easier than Finnish sounds, if, if that is possible. In the fullest sense of friendship, let me simplify. A is a friend of B when they both act reciprocally and knowingly for the sake of the good of the other. And second, each of them coordinates at least some of his or her activity with the activity of the other so that there is a sharing, community, mutuality, and reciprocity, not only of knowledge, but also of activity. Um, this is very different from what we contemporaries tend to think about friendship in a, uh, mostly in a romantic way. So <coughs> friendship as being a strong sentiment between individuals, that, that, that is not the sentiment of, uh, of kin and, and or sexual attraction, but a different one. And, and as, as the whole tradition has accepted, of course there is that, that strong feeling and that sentiment and that, and that experience of friendship that is different, but that is not what defines friendship that is a, a consequence, a good one, but a, a just a consequence or a sign of what is truly important, that friends act for the sake of the good of, or, of the other and that they share a common good, that they work together 
in pursuing. Uh, something that I think it's important to notice is that uh, since bonum diffusivum sui, the, the, the good is, is diffusive, uh, when, when someone shares some good, the natural tendency is to share other goods. And when someone shares a certain level of a particular good, the tendency is to open to, uh, that relationship to, to larger and deeper forms of, of human good. Um, and what is the problem with political friendship? So why is it that uh, having political friendships is, is, <coughs> is complicated? Well, th th there might be two, two, two reasons for that. The first one, which is uh, obvious uh, in, in Aristotle already, is that, well, according to Aristotle, we cannot have a lot of friends. The kind of, the intensity of the relationship that friendship demands is, it's in practice impossible to, to to maintain with, with many people. But the political community that we share with those that we can call political friends uh, is so big and tends to be so big that it is impossible to, to have that, that personal relationship. Still, political friendship is necessary for the political community to exist and it is, it is previous and more important than justice, which is uh, obviously necessary for, for political community. And the second question, and this is, and this leads to to my next, to the next part of, of the presentation is, well, what is the nature of the of the common good of political friendship? Is is it truly a good, the political common good, and is it truly a good that people can can share that leads to a true friendship, or is it just something? Uh, strategic, instrumental for, for individuals uh, looking closer to, to uh, looking, looking, looking like an alliance more than a political community, as Aristotle would say. Um, and in this regard, uh, I think the work of, of John Finnis is, is pretty well known and his well known uh, position is that the specifically political, the public good is instrumental. It's not, it's, not, it's not intrinsic. And that would lead initially to, to think that, well, then uh, political friendship can never be something very substantial. So these, these political friendships are not, are not truly friendships because true friendship is not just sharing something useful. Or, or some pleasurable activity, but some something substantially substantially good. Uh, but I think there are good reasons to 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 hold that. Yeah, it can be considered instrumental in certain ways, while at the same time uh, considering that the relationship, the political relationship, is 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 good in in itself. It's intrinsically good, and therefore that political friendship is friendship, and not just a strategic relationship with others. And, and to this point, I think it's important to notice that Finnish insistence on, on the instrumentality of the, of the public good is aimed at justifying the limitation of government in its jurisdiction. Both, I think, descriptively and normatively. So what the government can actually do for the common good and what the government should do for, for the common good, which is not everything. So the, the distinction between the, the common good of the political community, the substantial common good of the political community, which is a very complex combination of all, all the goods of all the particular communities and, and individuals, etc., is not the same as the specifically political common good or public good, which is the, the, the sphere of that, the part of that good that is attainable through the tools of, of government and law. And hence, it is important to, to differentiate the, the, the two things. And we can think of political friendship not as, not as the relationship between those, not, not only uh, the relationship between those that participate in the public good in the, in, the, in the specifically political common good, working together in, 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 any, in any way as we will see later uh, in, in the institutions of government, but 
but political friendship has been yeah, the, the common concern and work for the, for the good of the political community, which is larger than the, than the strictly uh, public good. Um, on the other hand, McIntyre is famously affirms that, that the modern state does not embody uh, the, the common good of the, of the political community and cannot. Uh, still, it is so pervasive that it is instrumentally necessary for any community sharing a true common good, such as a university or a family, to engage in relationship with, with the structures, bureaucratic structures of the state, to provide the necessary instrumental goods, of money, power, or, or uh, prestige that, that we all need. Uh, and, and therefore that any strategy in contemporary world requires to deal with the market and to deal with the state and there's nothing, and that might be corrupt, corrupting of our intrinsically meaningful relationships within communities, but it is nonetheless necessary to engage in that relationship. So in a way, uh, McIntyre would agree that the, the, the political, the, the good of the political community as it is uh, today is purely instrumental, but he would be um, unsatisfied with that situation while Finis would accept that it is okay that the public good is not does not serve completely the the, the common good of the of the political community. So how how much time do we have? Not much. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Can these can uh, so what what let's get in, turning back to the to the conflicts of, of modernity. Is it possible to, in this, in this situation, is it possible to, to have true, uh, to engage in, in, in political friendships, meaning that we, that we share a good with, uh, the political good with others and that we engage in, in, in true dialogue about, about that good and not just a strategic exchange of positions in, in rhetorical, debates. Um, and I think even for, for even within McIntyre's uh, description of, of the conflicts of modernity and the, our lack of a true political community, uh, and therefore the problems of, of living political friendship within that kind of, of social setting, it is important to notice that we, the, something that McIntyre insists on here and there in his last book, which is that we are all, as I usually say in my, in my classes to, to pitch this, most of the times, most of the people act as Aristotelians. And if they don't, it's because their ideas, the more they are trained and educated in, in, in the academic modern setting, the less they think as Aristotelian, and the more they participate in, in contemporary institutional setting, the less they behave as, as Aristotelians, but left Left alone, human beings act as Aristotelians, taking, taking the good of, of other people as their own good and the common goods of, of practices as, as, as a true good that is more important than the instrumental goods of, of, of money or, or, or power. So in a way, uh, even if the context of political poly, of mo modern politics makes it difficult to have a true polit uh, political friendship. It is still possible because people, in the bottom of their of their of their minds and hearts, still are concerned truly for 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 the common good. Um, in, in, in ethics, in the conflicts of modernity, he said, my claim is that even in societies in which agents are taught to think of themselves in quite other terms, the Aristotelian understanding of happiness often continues to be expressed in and presupposed by a wide range of activities, responses, and judgments. And this because it and the web of concepts of which it is a part captures certain truths about human beings, truths that we acknowledge in our everyday practices even when they are inconsistent with the way in which we represent ourselves to ourselves. Um, a second, so it, it is possible in personal relationship to unearth the Aristotelian that is behind the, 
the, the, the, the modern precisions. A second point that he makes is that, uh, but I will, I, I have to skip to, to, to the, I, I'm going to jump to the conclusions that include partly what I was going to, to discuss in this last part of this question. So to jump into the conclusions. First, the good life is not merely a private life, which seems pretty obvious, but implies that, that uh, political friendship is, 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 is necessary for the good life. But we need to have a, a precise definition of political friendship to understand what this means and what it doesn't mean. And I think it, it is important to differentiate <coughs> three levels, so to speak, in, in, in our definition of political friendship. One is that political friendship implies that everyone should be intentionally oriented towards the, the common good of the political community. And, and, and anyone who is not uh, is, is, is not is, is not living a, a good life. Is not being is not being moral. But operationally, not everyone participates in the institutional settings of of, of the political community of the public uh, common good. Uh, and there are many ways in which that can be done. So political friendship can be oper operationally believed in, in, in at very different levels, and even we, we could argue with no. Uh, direct participation in, in politics uh, at all. And experientially, in, in, in a third level, uh, this means that we should be entering in dialogue with other people aligned with our uh, political ideas or not about our common good and the relationship of our common good with the common goods that we participate in and the relationship of those common goods with the public good. Because the public good <coughs> Uh, instrumental or otherwise is a necessary part of, of, of the common good, uh, widely uh, understood. Um, an important point, and this is my last, my, my last comment, is that McIntyre insists in the importance of having friends and engaging in conversation even with those we disagree with uh, very deeply. So he seems to be saying that even that kind of disagreement is not an obstacle for political friendship if, if you are open and if you are not, as he says, too adversarial in your way of, of engaging with others you, who, do, who you disagree with. But he's very specific and very strongly clear about the impossibility of having those conversations with uh, people belonging to the elites. Hmm because their, their way of thinking and their interests are so, so strictly shaped by the, uh, defending their privileges that that dialogue is impossible. My conclusion is that I think even with, with those people, it, it, is, it is important at least to try to, to engage in this political friendship, but it is, it is also clear that it is particularly difficult. And for those of us, uh, and for us who, Obviously, belong to the elites in at least in the educational in the educational sense. It is important for engaging in true political friendship to get in touch with people who are not part of our privileged class. Thus, to avoid we becoming enclosed in our elite-minded discourse and, and understanding the concerns and the problems and the perspectives of people with, with totally different problems. Uh, I think that is, that is today for us uh, a particularly necessary way of exercising uh, political friendship. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, I started my stopwatch. Uh, on June 20th, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down its 7-2 decision in the case of American Legion versus American Humanist Association. Uh, the decision has been hailed as a victory for a more benevolent attitude toward religion and public life. Its immediate beneficial impact was to leave standing on public land a peace cross in Bladensburg, Maryland, uh, which we and our family used to go by all the time when we lived in Maryland. Uh, the cross honored 49 local residents who died in <coughs> World War I. In addition to the names of the fallen, the base of the cross is inscribed on its four sides with the words, valor, endurance, courage, devotion. 
Plaintiffs said the court represented an unconstitutional establishment of religion and demanded it be removed, destroyed, or have its arms cut off to create an obelisk. <clears throat> uh, now, in, in dealing with this, and I'll get back to the obelisk in a moment, but precedent suggested that the court deal with this in terms of what was called the Lemon Test, based on the 1971 case of <coughs> Lemon v. Kurtzman, which had three prongs uh, for the government's action dealing with religion to, uh, to be uh, valid under the Establishment Clause. Uh, the government's action must have a secular purpose, not have the principal or primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. Try that sometime. You know, somebody s sneezes and you say, bless you, you know, it's, it's gone. <laughs> Uh, and not involve the government in excessive entanglement with religion. Uh, the majority and the dissenters had opposing views of whether the cross uh, fulfilled the very first prong of the test. Justice Alito's majority opinion emphasized that over the years it had become a central symbol of World War I, acquiring a legitimate secular meaning as a symbol of sacrifice in the war. Uh, to be sure, five members of the seven went on to say, or to suggest at least, that the lemon test <coughs> has become unworkable in a lot of contexts, or all of them, and should be uh, replaced by another and more benevolent test. But they did not do that in this case. They were dealing with the precedents they had. Uh, the uh, dissenters, uh, said, no, that everyone knows that uh, this is a uh, uh, distinctly religious symbol. Uh, the Latin cross is the foremost symbol of the Christian faith, embodying the central theological claim of Christianity, that the Son of God died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that his death and resurrection offer the possibility of eternal life. By maintaining the peace cross, the state of Maryland was elevating Christianity over other faiths and religion over non-religion. Uh, now, in passing, I want to note that the majority uh, passed over the fact that the word sacrifice, which they emphasize so much as the secular meaning of the cross, has the original meaning of to make holy. And the plaintiffs ignored the fact that the obelisk was originally a symbol of the Egyptian sun god Ra, uh, and so is not secular in its origins either. And in fact, that the largest obelisk on earth is in the middle of, gasp, St. Peter's Square. Uh, no, the Washington Monument doesn't count. An obelisk has to be one piece of stone. Okay, so. Uh, so. The majority of the justices said, even if the original purpose of a monument was infused with religion, the passage of time may obscure that sentiment. As our society becomes more and more religiously diverse, a community may preserve such monuments, symbols, and practices for the sake of their historical significance or their place in a common cultural heritage. With sufficient time, religiously expressive monuments, symbols, and practices can become embedded features of a community's landscape and identity. The community may come to value them without necessarily embracing their religious roots. And they added that that rationale would not necessarily extend to a contemporary act by a state to maintain or erect a new cross honoring the fallen. Which raises the question, if that's the case, why would it be a problem to put up a cross now if we are even more secularized than people were during World War I? A uh, little bit of an indication that this really is a transitional opinion and can't stand in any permanent way by itself, but is pivoting towards a different test. Uh, my problem with the dissenters case uh, is that without necessarily believing in Jesus' divinity, his resurrection, or his offer of eternal life, one can recognize him as the key figure in human history who taught and embodied the message, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life 
for one's friends, John 15, 13. And in that case, the cross may remind us of the willingness of Jesus, the man for others, to die on the cross and so can stand for anyone's willingness to lay down his or her life for others, even in wartime. One objection would be, well, what about, though, the message that a soldier killed in war actually dies not for his friends, but for his country? That message was immortalized by the Roman poet Horace before Christ was born. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, in one of his poems. <coughs> Sweet and proper it is to die for one's country. That, too, has been repeated through the centuries and is inscribed over the rear entrance to the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater, designed in 1913 and built in 1920. But by the time the Peace Cross was built in 1925, the saying had lost some appeal, due in part to the horrors of World War I, recounted in Wilfred Owen's poem, titled sarcastically, Dulce et Decorum Est. It was written and circulated privately in 1918, shortly before Owen himself was killed in the war, and published in book form in 1920. After describing a fellow soldier's ghastly death from a chlorine gas attack, he says to an imagined friend that if he or she had witnessed this, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. Owen actually originally dedicated the poem specifically to a uh, a poet, Jesse Pope, who had propagandized in favor of the war, but he thought, uh, later thought better of this, you know, go, going after this person by name. That motto was also somewhat tainted by its original source. Uh, Horace was a court poet to Caesar Augustus, writing to inspire Romans to do their emperor's bidding and wipe out the Parthians or be considered uh, abject cowards. Uh, perhaps a bit par harshly, John Dryden, in his essay on the origins of satire, would later call Horace a well-mannered court slave. In any case, Horace lived in a pagan society which considered the state as having brought authority over the lives of its citizens, not having imbibed the Christian message about the unique and unrepeatable dignity of each <coughs> individual. Christians would add, each individual made to the image and likeness of God, in a society that has embraced the dignity and rights of the individual, the claims of a nation may seem a distant and abstract value compared to the sacrifice of human life itself, especially when the war is justified not by the survival of that person's nation, but by broader considerations of long-term interest or respect for treaties with other nations, as was true in World War I. And in fact, soldiers who have been in war know this very well. In his book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, <coughs> Lieutenant General Harold Moore, who led the first major U.S. combat mission against North Vietnamese insurgents in the Yadrang Valley in 1965, acknowledged love of country as one kind of love that led him and others to join the Army. He then says, another and far more transcendent love came to us unbidden on the battlefields, as it does on every battlefield and every war man has ever fought. We discovered in that depressing, hellish place where death was our constant companion, that we loved each other. We killed for each other, we died for each other, and we wept for each other. And in time, we came to love each other as brothers. In battle, our world shrank to the man on our left, the man on our right, and the enemy all around. We held each other's lives in our hands. Uh, on personal note, our, our son Thomas joined the army out of high school and was deployed to Iraq, although his personal view was that that war was a mistake. Uh, and uh, he fought there and was killed in action while doing so. He had done a very good job. His job that day had been to provide cover fire to protect his comrades and he was the only U.S. soldier who died in Mosul on that day. He knew this very well also. The idea of a love that makes us willing to die for our friends, is it religious or secular? Soldiers of any faith or no faith have lived by it. 
Yet the secular or pagan world prior to Christianity could make little sense of it. The world's two great treatises on friendship come to us from Aristotle in Book 8 of the Nicomachean Ethics and the Roman orator and statesman Cicero in his essay on friendship. But Aristotle treats a good man's willingness to die for his friends or his country simply as an elevated kind of enlightened self-interest because, quote, he would prefer a short period of intense pleasure to a long one of mild enjoyment, a 12-month of noble life to many years of humdrum existence, and one great and noble action to many trivial ones. To Aristotle, this man is benefiting himself more than the friend. He is making uh, himself better than others. And Cicero, who is credited with having a more idealistic notion of friendship than many of his Roman uh, fellow citizens, asks, where on earth are you going to find anybody who will be keener to advance his friend's career than his own? He said that someone who is willing to value a friend more than himself is, quote, almost superhuman. It is in Christian accounts that we find this kind of love honored not as a noble kind of selfishness or as superhuman, but as a pattern for human life. In his great encyclical, The Gospel of Life, Pope St. John Paul II says of great acts of heroism, as in war, these are the most solemn celebration of the gospel of life, for they proclaim it by the total gift of self. They are the radiant manifestation of the highest degree of love, which is to give one's <coughs> life for the person loved. They are a sharing in the mystery of the cross, in which Jesus reveals the value of every person and how life attains its fullness in the sincere gift of self. The Catholic, holds, Catholic Church holds that we are created to love as Christ does, and Christ's example brings this innate meaning of our own lives to its fullness. Even a non-believer, though, can recognize the cross of Jesus, the ultimate man for others, as a paradigm instance of the gift of self that transcends secular calculations of our self-interest. Only after coming to this conference did someone else remind me in this context that uh, Marc Chagall, the great Jewish artist, when he did a painting to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust, could think of no better symbol than the cross. This self-sacrificing love of friends than which there is no greater love therefore joins the ranks of other key values that are most compellingly found in a religious and a particularly Christian account of human life. Other such values include the idea of marriage as a bond parted only by death, an idea that Jesus insisted on rebuking even Moses' accommodation to people's hardness of heart, the unconditional love of parents for their young children as their equals in human dignity, where Jesus' example of letting the little children come to me and say we must be as little children to enter the kingdom of God contradicted the prevailing Jewish of, view of that time that they were to be seen but not heard and turning upside down the pagan idea that they were disposable property <coughs> subject to the will of the pater familias. Another one is the very idea of innate and unalienable human rights arising from I would almost say dumbed down from the idea that our creator created each one of us out of an inexpressible love. Religious or secular, all those values have a religious origin, uh, or at least it is by religious influence that they have come to be honored throughout Western civilization. If cut completely free from their religious roots, as many have tried to do in our society, they weaken and may die. Yet precisely by putting us in touch with the sacred, with a perception of reality that transcends our day-to-day -day existence, they give human life its meaning and make our secular civilization possible, especially if it is to be a civilization of valor, endurance, courage, and devotion. It would be a good thing if this were more fully recognized in our culture, perhaps even in our laws. Thank you.
Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, to the center, uh, to Carter, of course, and uh, Margaret, who does all the hard work in organizing, um, to Professor Keyes um, for chairing the panel. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, of course. I'm uh, sitting here marveling at the contrast of the between the excitement I have, and I'm sure so many of you have coming to this conference, and then all the political science conferences in my discipline that people just absolutely disdain and spend the entire lead up to the conference, during the conference, talking about how much they hate going. Um, and so um, I'm just uh, I'm really, uh, really thrilled to be at the, the best academic event of the year. Um, this paper also, to echo my friend Ricardo, is uh, a work in progress. Uh, I wish there were a much less distinguished audience out there right now. Um, but uh, this was uh, an idea um, that I had developed uh, a little while back and then um, want, to, want to make it better. And so I actually wanted to come to uh, this table uh, with, some, with some questions at the end. And I, I know from experience in this conference, uh, I get uh, a lot of really good feedback uh, on the papers. Um, so here goes. Um, there is, a, there is a story in the Bible uh, in the uh, 21st chapter of 2 Samuel uh, where David, King David, uh, is dealing with a famine in the land and he turns to God um, to ask uh, what's going on and what can be done. Um, and God informs him that, this, that the famine is a punishment for uh, the previous king, King Saul's crimes against the Gibeonites. Uh, now the exact details between Saul and the Gibeonites are a little bit complicated, um, uh, but the, uh, the short version is that Saul was responsible uh, for uh, the deaths of many of them uh, and uh, was being held responsible. And so David, King David, had to go to the Gibeonites to ask them um, how he could atone for King Saul's sins and thereby hopefully bring an end uh, to the famine. Um, and so the Gibeonites say, uh, what we want is we want you to uh, hang and leave hanging uh, the seven, uh, male seven remaining male descendants of Saul uh, to put them to death uh, and leave their bodies out to rot. Um, and so David complies. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what David does in order to um, purge the sin. Now, the Talmud, uh, the great uh, rabbinic interpretation and commentary on scripture and, and much, much beyond that, um, use this story to explain uh, the teaching that the Gibeonites are one of the few uh, peoples who are not permitted uh, under any circumstances to convert into the nation of Israel, to join the people of Israel. Um, so the rabbis, uh, here's a, a short quote from the Talmud. David tried to pacify the Gibeonites, meaning to present an alternative option, you know, to, for, uh, to get their forgiveness, but they would not be pacified. Thereupon he said to them, this nation Israel is distinguished by three characteristics. They are merciful, modest, and benevolent. Only he who cultivates these three characteristics is fit to join this nation. Um, and so the Gibeonites' failure uh, to, to uh, display one of these characteristics, especially the mercifulness, uh, explains why the Gibeonites are not allowed to join. Um, but this leaves us with a question. Did the Gibeonites do something wrong or not? Um, if the Gibeonites did something, if the Gibeonites did something wrong in demanding the execution of Saul's male descendants, then why does David comply? How can he go along with it? And how could this be what satisfies God uh, in bringing an end to the famine? Um, and if the Gibeonites didn't do anything wrong, um, then why this result? Why the result that this request leads for a uh, permanent ban? I mean, now I'd say it's more of a favor than anything else, but a permanent ban from joining the people of Israel. Um, uh, to answer this, I want to uh, bring up, and this may be uh, uh, more well known among the philosophers, but the philosopher Jeffrey Murphy um, has an interesting uh, chapter on the difference between justice and mercy. Um, and he talks about uh, what he calls, I think, the dilemma of mercy or something thereabouts. And he says, imagine a case where someone's guilty of a crime, um, and then uh, in sentencing this person, uh, we take into account all of the mitigating factors. So the person was a juvenile, uh, the person maybe came from uh, an abusive background or so on and so on. Whatever we might think uh, might be the appropriate mitigating circumstances for this person to have a, a, a lighter sentence than someone in, uh, who committed a comparable crime. And uh, Murphy says, well, uh, to take into account uh, the mitigating factors uh, is not to perform an act of mercy. That, in fact, is justice. Or to fail <coughs> to distinguish between uh, the relevant character, to fail to distinguish between 
uh, otherwise similarly situated criminals uh, would be to fail to act in justice. And so it's not an act of mercy um, to say that because the circumstances that led to this crime are different, this is why we treat premeditated crimes different from crimes of passion, so on and so forth. Um, alternatively, um, if there aren't, uh, let's say there are no mitigating factors um, and we simply uh, let this person off because we're feeling happy that day, um, the, the judge you know, says, I'm in a good mood, you get a lighter sentence. Well, um, then there's something wrong with mercy because uh, the society that rightly demands justice in this case uh, is being deprived of that justice. Uh, Murphy puts it this way, if we simply use the term mercy to refer to certain of the demands of justice, like the mitigating circumstances, then mercy ceases to be an autonomous virtue and instead becomes as a part of justice. It thus becomes obligatory, and all the talk about gifts, acts of grace, supererogation, and compassion becomes quite beside the point. If, on the other hand, mercy is totally different from justice and actually requires or permits that justice sometimes be set aside, then it counsels injustice. In short, more, in short mercy is either a vice or redundant. <laughs> And here's, uh, and, and so here's the way out of it. Um, if we think maybe, uh, if we go outside of criminal law and think of maybe something uh, more in private law, so you owe me $10, um, I have every uh, right to demand the repayment of those $10, uh, you have an obligation to pay me the $10 you owe me, and yet I am no, under no obligation to demand the payment. Uh, I have every right to forgive the debt, to relinquish the debt. And that, Murphy says, um, would be an act of mercy. Um, taking then from uh, um, Jewish legal scholar Suzanne Stone, um, uh, I would add that to stand on one's rights, to stand on one's rights can then be both just and unmerciful. So if you owe me the money, um, it might very well be that demanding the money from you would be just, it would be my right to do so, um, and yet it would be unmerciful um, if for whatever reason, under the circumstances, um, I can be merciful there and forgive the debt. And this is supposed to be, um, uh, for Professor Stone, the explanation to the story of the Gibeonites, um, that the Gibeonites did, in justice, have the right to demand what they demanded, as gruesome as it is um, to us today. Um, at the same time, um, they could have been merciful. Um, they could have said, uh, we forgive the crimes of Saul even without the execution of his surviving male descendants. And this is relevant for us because uh, for, for the, the end of the story and the, the Talmudic dictum, um, because that allows us to see the banning of the Gibeonites from entering the people of Israel um, not strictly as a punishment, again, because punishment would be the wrong way to think of it if they have the right to demand this injustice, um, but because the people of Israel is not just a nation, the people of Israel uh, is a family. Uh, and in a family, the central, the central virtue is not justice, but is mercy. As justice is to politics, so mercy is to the family. And what I want to say from that about politics is that uh, to the extent we wish <coughs> for more than that in our shared lives together, to the extent that we wish for more um, than just uh, the coexist of the popular bumper stickers, um, it's because um, we wish to be part of more than just a bare political community. We want our society, we yearn for our society to be more uh, like, if I may, an extended family. But to be in a family is to begin not from a position of standing on one's rights, but to be in a position of relinquishing them. Um, I want to point out that uh, since the time I started thinking about this, the debates, I'll say one more tiny word about this at the end, but the debates today over both nationalism and about liberalism um, are debates that in an important way, that in important ways are thinking about what it takes to be a community, what a political community is and what a political community should be, and what it takes for a political community not to atomize so severely that it destroys itself. Um, in a family, in a family, uh, and in politics, we think one of the important ways for thinking about politics, and I know I saw Professor Bradley here and I've learned a lot about this uh, from him, um, that one of the important ways to understand justice and, um, uh, and justice, including in, in criminal punishment, is thinking about um, through the natural law tradition about the just distribution of benefits and burdens uh, and the way justice can ensure justice in a political community can infer a just distribution of benefits and burdens among citizens. 
Um, I, you know, I tell my students, so if I, uh, um, if you drive around the block a hundred times looking for a spot and I conveniently park at the fire hydrant right in front of the entrance, um, right? So, so you've taken on, uh, in order to preserve access to the fire hydrant, you've taken on the burden of spending all your time looking for a spot. And there I am just pulling right up into VIP parking. Uh, and right, the, the fine that I have to pay or with the penalty I have to pay um, helps to, to society, my debt to society that I pay helps to redistribute uh, the benefits benefits and burdens um, fairly and more complicated than that, of course, but just as a quick stylized example. Um, but in a family, uh, the maldistribution of, uh, a family in contrast is built on a maldistribution of benefits and burdens. Uh, I'm learning now having uh, two small children uh, who are responsible for my current physical condition. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and, and that maldistribution of benefits and burdens uh, is necessary. Often they are, I mean, par parents sacrifice quite willingly uh, in many cases, um, but even when the burdens are unwanted, um, if one family member betrays another and so on, um, uh, even if uh, even if the one who is betrayed is entitled to recompense, um, that is not a formula for sustaining the family and the family unit. Um, uh, and so... Um, there can be no family life if everyone insists all the time on an exact accounting of gains and losses. Uh, and this is true in mundane things as well, right? If uh, children might not always distribute uh, bathroom time equally, right? Somebody might hog the bathroom in the morning and other children uh, might get upset about that. Um, and, uh, and that's not to say that it's okay for one of the children to be selfish or that parents shouldn't address that. But it is to say that um, an exact accounting uh, of, of, uh, of what is owed to whom at all all times uh, will break the family down, will destroy the family. The family cannot survive if everyone stands on all his rights all the time. There can be no family life without mercy. Um, there was uh, uh, a story a few years back that struck me about uh, somebody in a Starbucks, uh, who this came national news, who bought coffee uh, for the person in line uh, behind him or her. Um, and so that person thought it'd be a good idea to buy coffee for the person in line behind him or her. And after that, and it went on, this went on, the word started to spread and people kind of, and you had a line going out the door for hours and hours, like the entire business day of everybody buying coffee for the person. Remember, this is national news now um, about this giving of coffee, right? And you saw, and okay, it's pretty cool. It's really nice, cute story. You think about it, right? It wasn't even, nobody sacrificed that much, right? Everybody <laughs> paid for one cup of coffee, and, except maybe the first person and got one cup of coffee, right? And you would gladly pay for a cup of coffee for a family member, for a friend, right? But when this happens among citizens, right, who are not family members, who are our friends, it's national news. Um, and again, I know the, the normal operation of things is not going to allow these things to happen. I'm not saying there's something wrong with America because this doesn't happen every day. Um, but even so, um, I think it's worth noting um, that uh, um, the contrast between what would be completely ordinary and unremarkable uh, among family members or friends um, and what's, uh, and what's groundbreaking in political life or in, or in civic life. Um, and so um, my thesis, as it were, um, is that, uh, and I'll get a little spicier in a minute, but my thesis is that uh, our political life, the kind of the obvious part, that our political life can be improved through em emulating family life in certain ways. And second, um, the, the idea that may have generated all this originally, um, that defending religious freedom now more than ever depends on this. Um, it depends on promoting in society what I'll just call for short a bit inartfully the family ethic. Um, and why is that the case? Um, well, uh, obviously, everyone, I'm sure everyone in this room knows that the, the, the hot topic um, in the culture wars today, or one of the hot topics in the culture wars today, um, is the opposition between, on one side, our religious liberty claims, and on the other side, anti-discrimination anti law or anti-discrimination claims. Um, now, in case it needs to be said, though I suppose it doesn't, I'm not saying that religious people, uh, people making religious liberty claims in these cases are wrong in the way a selfish family member who hogs the bathroom is wrong. I'm not saying that. Um, I am saying um, that we can get along and live together even uh, when we disagree uh, if we don't stand on our rights. Um, now here's the problem and here's the question, um, uh, the first question uh, I wanna put to the, and the biggest question maybe uh, to put to the group. Um, so I like, I like all this material, I was glad I, you know, have this, um, but here's the thing that bothers me the most. Um, I'm worried um, that what I'm saying sounds like special pleading for the right, um, which is the side I'm on. I'm conservative, freely confess here. Um, 
Um, uh, because what I'm saying, right? So think about these culture war examples. How does this work? So Jack the Baker, Masterpiece Cake Shop, this is easy, just as not because the details of the case matter uh, for my purposes, but you've got uh, a couple, you've got two individuals of the same sex in Denver um, who want to have a wedding ceremony and they ask the baker to make them a custom wedding cake and the baker uh, can't do so for religious, the baker's Christian uh, and can't do so. Um, now, uh, fortunately, um, this couple had no shortage of options in Denver uh, for procuring a cake. And so the, right, the obvious solution, right, it's, it's probably harder to, hard to find more Christian bakers uh, in Denver who wouldn't bake the cake. Um, and so uh, the obvious common sense solution to this problem is that they pick any other bakery in Denver uh, and get a cake, right? Obviously, we know that's not the way it went, and it went to court all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, with a little bit of family ethic into the mix, right? The, the, uh, the, the couple could have said um, to itself, to themselves, whatever, um, could have said, uh, uh, well, we believe that we have a right um, to buy a cake from this baker. That's what we believe. Um, but it would, uh, it would, the burden on us to get a cake somewhere else is so low um, that our civic life, our society doesn't benefit uh, from uh, compelling this caker, uh, this baker to bake a cake. <coughs> caker, that's a good, that's a good word to use. He makes caker makes cakes, right? To I'll run with it, right? To compel this caker uh, to make us, uh, to make us, to make us a cake. Um, um, but. Uh, but he right. But as I say, here's the problem. Um, and same thing, right? So um, this person wants to get an abortion. Um, why does this person need to compel this doctor uh, to perform the abortion? Again, let's assume for simplicity's sake in these cases that uh, there are other options, um, and we can talk about cases where there aren't. So, um, so, so what I'm worried is that all the uh, all the cases. Um, in these, you know, hot uh, culture war situations are cases where uh, the situation is structured so that I, on the right, am asking the people on the left um, not to stand on their rights and say, why do you have to force the doctor? Why do you have to force the baker? Um, uh, and so... Um, and is that, is that because it's special pleading? Is that because it's just a coincidence that all the hot cases today are structured that way, where the side that's insisting on its rights too much is the side that I'm not on? Um, I, is it a little too convenient that they're all structured that way, right? Or can we think of any cases where we would agree that the right shouldn't the conservative side um, could contribute to uh, a healthier civic life by not standing on its rights. Not because I'm eager to find such things, but I wanna know if this is really an intellectually honest theory or, or maybe it's an intellectually honest theory that conveniently, again, has all the cases aligned correctly. Um, because, which leads me then to the secondary question just in this part, which is, why don't you just say back to me, well, why do we really need a family ethic, right? The reason all the cases are so conveniently structured this way is because we don't need to bring in this fancy concept of not standing on one's rights. If you understand religious liberty properly, you're going to understand that all these people should win in court anyway, the baker, the doctor, so on and so forth, um, because any legislature in its right mind, any uh, court in its right mind is going to recognize the right of a caker not to be compelled, uh, there we go again, a caker not to be compelled um, to bake a cake against his conscience, of a doctor not to perform an abortion against her, uh, against her conscience, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, uh, maybe it's not, so you say back to me, maybe it's not about uh, inserting a family ethic into our political life. Maybe it's just about getting the concept of rights right. If we get the concept of rights right, all the right people are going to be protected, pun intended. Um, so, um, uh, so that is the uh, that is the big that is the big question um, that I have uh, at the end of this project um, that I want to raise. And now let me just raise in my remaining seconds um, the secondary thing, which is if we want if we need a cult of, uh, uh, a 
if we need to cultivate a family ethic, how do we do that, right? So, okay, one answer, we got to rebuild civic life. Old story. If anybody has the magic bullet for that, silver bullet for that, please let me know. We have to rebuild the family. Uh, okay, that's not something that has been unremarked upon and certainly not in these circles, right? And family, not just because like people, because that's where people learn to be good citizens, and right? I mean, it, people who share bedrooms as kids are probably better citizens in college in a shared dormitory, right? So a sleepaway camp, eight weeks in a bunk with 14 other kids and bunk beds and everything like this. You learn to live with other people. Uh, and that's important. Um, uh, and then finally, um, and these are my last few seconds, so I know I'm out of time. Um, um, it's back to the debates on liberalism uh, and nationalism. So the debate on nationalism, what are the necessary preconditions for building up a political life that's more than bare coexistence? Is it cultural similarities? Is it creedal acceptance? Is it something like that? And on liberalism, right? Can we, and again, not new here, um, does liberalism erode the bonds that make our society feel like a family? I'm not on the side that says so, but I think we need to ask it. Can liberalism, in fact, adopt and incorporate a family ethic, or is it fundamentally incompatible? Uh, so sorry to leave you with questions, or maybe that's the best way to do it, but thank you very much. Justice or mercy, uh, or or both, but the, thank you to the panelists for all keeping very easily within the requested time, so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, so uh, please, yeah, who would, who would like to begin? Yeah, that would be perfect. Okay. Hi, thank you, Thomas Slayerman from uh, Connecticut. My question relates to whether or not, and to what extent, one or all of you would like to expound on the thought of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and his vision of voluntary associations and their role in stimulating civic life and friendship. Uh, to what extent is um, his vision important to this topic of the relationship between civic life and friendship? Thank you. Well, let, let me, I'll just say one word because I, I raced past it at the end, but uh, and having actually just in just done Tocqueville in uh, intro political theory this this past week, it's very much on my mind. Um, and we can go from Tocqueville all the way to Putnam, right? And the uh, let's let's stipulate um, that I totally buy what Tocqueville is saying, um, but then I also recognize that's not that's not where we are now. Um, so let's. How does that get us closer? To, I'm not rejecting your question. I'm just kind of accepting it and reinforcing it. So what do we do about the fact um, that Tocqueville had the right idea uh, about what can make America work? Um, and that's not a reasonable description of how America is anymore. We're all bowling alone. Um, is it, can we just, you know, snap our fingers and get, pa get people back into uh, these voluntary associations? And I have, um, and I don't, I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, yes, I was, uh, your question made me remember something, I think it was Justice Alito in a concurring opinion in a religious freedom case who cited voluntary associations and what, what are sometimes called mediating institutions as uh, our greatest bulwark against overreaching by the state. And I don't think he was meaning that that because these voluntary associations that's going to promote civic friendship, it, it could be creating competing and even hostile voluntary associations. But only if the government uh, is reminded not to enforce a conformity, a one size fits all on all questions, do you even create the space in which people can dialogue with each other on those values and uh, possibly form friendships? It creates the possibility. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, our, our, yeah, Archbishop from the Eparchy of Philadelphia who reminded us that in a society, in a totalitarian society, uh, that's impossible because you know that the government is the only institution and anyone can turn you into the government, including your own family. And so you wear a mask that prevents pe many people from forming any real relationships with others. That's what we do not want. Um, thank you. Connecting with uh, what I was intending to, to, to say, I think political friendship can be, ex can be an, 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 a, a way of exercising it is partic particularly adequate is, is engaging with, with free associations. And I think uh, 
that is a step in the good direction of avoiding uh, political power, specifically public power to become despotic and, and totalitarian. But I don't think it solves the problem of the political power per se, limited or not, being despotic in the way it operates as opposite to political in the sense of open, truly open to participation and deliberation, et cetera. I'm more on the side of thinking that that is an ideal that is not possible at the level of, of nation states as we know them. Uh, and I sometimes fear that, uh, that focusing on free associations might make us forget that 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 is the case and create the sensation that we are in truly political and open and free societies while we are not. So participating in, in, in that social life is on the one hand helpful to, to limit government, might be helpful to raise aware, uh, awareness about the despotic nature of, of, of uh, public authorities of, of the state, but it might also be blinding of that, of that particular problem. Yeah, thank you very much to all. I, I hope I will have time to speak to all of you separately for at least half an hour each. Um, and it's a, yeah, I'm, it's a threat. Um, I have, uh, in particular for uh, Professor Mark, um, two points that I'm confused about. So you, and it's a question. So to your question, I answer with another question. You happen to use the word emulate the family. So the political friendship should, should emulate the, the, the family. As a criminal lawyer, but I would say the family can be a very bad place. I would ask, isn't it that whatever we do in the family is what we do in the state? So there is nothing straight. We are Aristotelian, as Professor Kayas was saying before, because in the end we either are good citizen and then we will be good parents, or we, we are bad at both. And I think this is what we are seeing. Um, and the other question or things that I would like to point out from the legal perspective is that I think Murphy is, I'm not an expert, but I think there is something wrong when we say that it would not be merciful. Like it, it's merciful in the first case, it's not merciful in the other. I think that what, miss, what is missing there is the justice of punishment. So of course, it is not merciful in the second case because what is not in the picture is the fact that the person who commits a crime deserves being punished. That's at least the idea of punishment that I've always believed in because if it was only for prevention, then, but, but that is the reason why it's not merciful. And instead in the other case, it is because even though he would deserve punishment, he doesn't deserve him anymore because there are all these mitigating factors. So these are just, thank you. Um, well, on the, on the first one, um, depending on what you meant by what we do in the family, we do in the state. Um, so I think there's a, maybe it is the case <clears throat> that the people who are bad citizens are also bad family members. Um, I was trying to give them the benefit of doubt and assuming that people, the people we're thinking of here are not as bad to their family members as they are to their fellow citizens. Um, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but I certainly, in other words, I agree with you. And again, I said it very quickly, but I agree with you that the virtues we learn in the family um, will inform how we act as citizens. Um, but I also think it's not, um, I, we don't have the sense um, that we, and I don't, again, this is an analogy that, that things are not the same. I don't think most people have the sense that they ought to approach their fellow citizens in a way that's at all similar to the way they approach their family members. Now, not exactly the same, of course. Um, we, we, we owe our family members more. I'm not denying that. Um, but that we should sacrifice at all for our fellow citizens, um, that there's any reason not to stand on our rights up to their furthest edge. Uh, I'm not sure that enough people believe that um, uh, or practice that, um, though, Again, agreeing that if they're bad citizens, it may be a sign that they're also bad family <coughs> members. Um, 
Uh, on the second thing, um, I, it makes sense to me what you're saying, um, and maybe uh, it was too simplistic, but I think we just have to, that sounds like the kind of thing we have to talk about in more detail, um, because uh, it sounded to me like what you were saying was the same thing I was saying with a, a slight shift in the terminology, and maybe there wasn't really a substantive uh, disagreement there, but if I was using justice to assume taking into account everything one ought to take into account. Um, and I don't, and if what you were saying was that um, it would be unmerciful to the criminal because the criminal deserves it, I'm not sure if I agree with that, but that we'd have to think about that more. It'd be unmer it would be um, unmerciful uh, to the people who are owed the justice, at least, like the society that makes the demand of justice. It would be unmerciful. Um, it would be unjust to them to deny them the justice by being merciful. I don't know if it would be wrong to the criminal to deny him the justice of being punished, but we have to talk about that. And can I ask, please identify yourself? Thank you for your brilliant talks. Um, I am Michael Chanas. I'm a senior at Christendom College. Um, Putting aside Alistair McIntyre saying that natural rights don't exist, I'm going to put that aside for a second. Happy, happy to do so. Yeah. I would say that a correct understanding of rights um, would be probably take within themselves a Judeo Christian understanding of what a human person is on that understanding. And so, would you assert or would you say um, that? disagreements when rights are involved may be impossible because the same sort of idea of hum who, what a human person is and what they deserve is different, vastly different among the different people within our community. Uh, yeah. yeah, and for the panel. Oh, okay. Um, so yes and no. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm gonna associate myself uh, again, happily and freely with uh, John Finnis and the New Natural Law School. Uh, and so I think that, I think that a Judeo-Christian um, uh, worldview is not necessary to arrive, right? If we all act like Aristotelians, right? That's not where Aristotle got it. Um, but and any, be that as it may, um, I, obviously there's a, a lot there together. Truth cannot contradict truth, I suppose. Um, uh, and um, it's not going to be the case. And I, I also will not deny uh, that uh, there may be deep anthropological uh, assumptions or uh, starting deeply different anthropological starting points that explain why there are these kind of disagreements. And yet, because, again, agreeing with, uh, with my friend, uh, Professor Calleja, that um, because people left to their own devices mostly are Aristotelians, and I do this course with my students every day, is to show them actually, no, they are working from almost all the same assumptions um, about it, when they're not being ideological, when they're just acting. Um, they actually are working from most of the same assumptions. Um, and, uh, and, and the very account they would need to give of their rights would put into place all the pieces I would need to show them why my account, why, why my rights are to be vindicated, uh, and so on. Um, uh, so, so I, I, I do partly, I, I'm, I'm recognizing, acknowledging that there are very different anthropologies at play now in our divided society. Um, but if I think if we took cases in practice, we might be able to sidestep that is what I'm inclined to think. It's a good question. Uh, could I build on that? I guess maybe the last question here, but, um, one of the characteristics, I think, especially uh, Professor Kalea, your your talk was this kind of assumption of the of a classical liberal order, which we don't agree on ends, because we don't agree on ends, we can't have a political friendship. But actually, there are many things people do agree about. Um, for example, pretty much everyone agrees that minimization of poverty is a good thing. Or if you take it to the local level, at least until very recently, <laughs> school boards had high level agreement about you know good education for our children is, is a common good for that community. So there are many places where we actually agree on ends. Now, of course, the problem is you go to the next level of generality, begin to diverge as to, but let's, just, let's say for the moment that politics can be about means and not ends. And then in that case, it seems possible that you could have true political friendship because you're arguing about means, but not about ends. I'm just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think as, as echoing what, what you were saying, we agree about we agree about ends as long as we don't think ideologically or totally shaped by by our education or or social settings. So I think I think a true conversation about ends can happen 
in our political communities, but not is not per, not within the institutions and with the language of our political institutions. Those do not help to reach real agreements, although it, they might be helpful to reach practical, pragmatic agreements on, on, on the means, which is something also necessary and good, peace, uh, security, and, and justice. It's, it's basic. And um, so, yes, I think, and so therefore I think political friendship can be and should be exercised in, in, in our societies, but being, being aware of the difficulties that our political institutions and language pose to, to those uh, friendships. Um, and I think, yeah, it is, it is interesting to see that, that uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier, but on passing that, that McIntyre is not, for instance, who is very, very serious about the incommensurability of, of arguments, etc. He is very emphatic in, in pushing people into getting into close friendships and, and deep conversations with people you disagree deeply with. And, and, and I think, yep, yeah, I agree with that. I think we could take one more question. Uh, possibly, well, two, I said, how about, uh, you know, this is a toss-up. <laughs> All right, my name is sitting there, we go. This will be our last question, and then, okay. Hi, I'm Mary Fiorito from, uh, from here at the center. I, um, speaking of friendships among people with whom you deeply disagree, and this would be for anyone on the panel, can you think of any real life examples of that outside of the Ginsburg-Scalia friendship that everyone <laughs> knows so well that you would use as sort of a role model or example of how this can actually in real life take place? Well, I can mention an example from last week, but this is from Spain, and I don't think it's particularly helpful for uh, an American audience, but it's a real example. I, I, I gave a session along with a guy who is a speechwriter for the prime minister, Spanish prime minister, who is a socialist, progressive, and, he, and, and we were discussing with students in communication about polarization in our societies, and he said, uh, he's not from Madrid, but he's now living in Madrid. He said, all the true friends that I've made in Madrid ever since I came are conservatives. And that must be for a reason, for, 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 for some reason. So I think there are examples. I'm sure Americans oh, have some uh, more. Well, one of the more famous political friendships that transcended uh, partisan lines was, was between uh, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. It probably helped to be Irish. I don't know. Uh, but they had uh, a great personal appreciation for each other. And, and because of that, we're able to cooperate on some things between uh, Congress and the White House. Uh, in the session in the auditorium uh, before this one where people were talking about John Henry Newman, uh, he had uh, very good friends who, were, who remained Anglican or Protestants of other varieties after he became a Catholic. And uh, he had great appreciation for their commitment to Christ. So that much they had in common. But he, he was basically in, uh, primarily interested in making sure they would remain true to the Christian faith as they saw it, even though he might uh, seriously disagree with their particular interpretation of that faith. Uh, and partly it was, it was practical. It was, he felt the common enemy was relativism and uh, secularism. And they were they agreed on that. They disagreed on almost everything else, but he was encouraging them to be good Christians of their kind. So those might be too. So it's, it's, I, well, if the center hasn't brought them yet, just in this world, uh, professors Robert George and Cornell West have a, what's informally known as the road show, where they're going, they go around the country, maybe around the world now, doing this exact. I mean, they're they're arguing for the importance of liberal edu in the classical sense, liberal education. But the purpose of the road show is to model that these two people, both identify as Christian, of course, but the two people who have radical political disagreements uh, are close friends, and, and that irks a lot of people, are close friends, uh, and they care about, the, they have the shared love of truth. So if the center hasn't brought them yet, you should sign up for the roadshow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, thank you all very much.